Apart from that, I'm um, very happy to uh, a slightly guilty uh, talk because I know I'm not very good at this, and I know lots of us aren't. Is um, from making to maintenance uh, by Laura James. Thanks very much. Thank you. Hi. Going to be talking a little bit about innovation versus maintenance, sharing some random examples of things that need maintaining and issues about maintenance, challenges and opportunities, and how I came to be organizing a festival of maintenance on the 22nd of September, which is quite soon now. So I can't see you at all, but hands up if you're a member of a makerspace or hackspace or any similar community. Okay, keep your hands up if you play any role in actively looking after that space. Okay, I have all the maintainers here, so that's awesome. Cool, that's quite rare. Um, people tend not to think about maintenance. Um, I'm here because last December we had Maker Assembly, which was a get together of a lot of maker culture and maker space people. And we really were trying to talk about local manufacturing, the circular economy, and things like that. But what kept coming up was maker space sustainability and who looks after things in the maker world. And that really kind of made us wonder if we should do something about it. A lot of maker culture is about making new things. And in a lot of Western contexts, that's gadgets and gizmos, things that are fun for a while, um, but generally then gather dust until they're eventually thrown away. Making and fixing useful things does happen, but it's often a little less visible, a little less exciting. So we used to do more making and mend repairing and maintaining and mending the things, the everyday items that we have. And we've started to do that less as it's become cheaper to buy new things and more expensive to get things mended well. Um, even complex items that we might buy today, like consumer electronics, are often designed to be thrown away. And at Maker Assembly, we really felt that the making and manufacturing of essential items uh, made locally and repaired and looked after locally could be go a good thing for the UK. We were looking ahead to both dystopian and utopian futures, and in both cases, it seemed like we need to get better at looking after things. And we talked a lot about makerspace sustainability, which is probably quite relevant for this crowd. It's extremely unevenly distributed. There are some long-lived makerspaces, I'm from Cambridge Makespace and we celebrated our fifth birthday this year. Uh, but there's a lot of spaces that are set up without much thought to maintenance. They get some initial capital, some grants, um, but then they don't think about how they'll sustain, how they'll have an ongoing business model. And it can be difficult to assess the impact of spaces to get more money later on. So we've seen quite a lot of spaces closing down over the last couple of years, which is sad. But it's interesting when you think about making and maintaining, although maker culture and maker space tools make it easier to look after stuff, actually when you're making stuff it's way easier and nicer to use new parts than to try to scrabble around reusing bits and pieces. And it's fun to make new things, but not so much fun to look after them. This is an example from Does Liverpool, they made this knitting machine and it was really cool and they've loved showing it off at Makefests and things. But actually now it's broken and no one can really be asked to fix it up. So that's a very classic make space dynamic. And one of the challenges is that good maintenance, like in the case of car maintenance, it's invisible. You don't know that things have been repaired. It's good when you don't realize it's happening. Except, of course, when it's not. This is Kintsugi, visible maintenance, visible repair. And here's an example which is darning. The invisibility is kind of relational. Maintenance work still happens, whether the result is visible or not. And it's only rendered invisible to the people who aren't paying attention. Some objects you do kind of know are being maintained. Um, but stuff that is kind of ready to use every day by lots of people without showing any traces of maintenance is quite rare. There's also examples where we've designed out maintenance. In one laptop, a child in Paraguay, it was designed to be resilient, but not to be repaired. It was almost impossible to repair the screens and the power supplies when they broke. So there's also digital maintenance. In this case, this maintenance is hidden, perhaps under layers of digital things. So Facebook and Google are really dependent on Wikipedia content. And the maintenance of Wikipedia is really below the hood. We all might know that Wikipedia needs maintenance, but when you see that content through Google, you tend to forget that the maintenance needs to be happening somewhere else. So how do we value the work of maintenance when, if it's done well, you don't even notice it? It's hard to recognize it because it's out of sight and out of mind. And maintenance just isn't as cool as making new things. 
If you make new things, you get attention. You get to stand on stages giving talks, but keeping stuff running, cleaning equipment, looking after communities, be that online or offline, looking after relationships, repairing equipment, all these things tend not to get you much attention, much interest, even though makers do need the things that they use to be maintained as well. And all of our businesses, and organizational forms of investment tend to be biased towards making new stuff. Um, it's much easier to say, I'm going to make a business to make new things and sell them than it is to say, I'm going to have a business that's going to look after stuff and care for it and keep it in use. And so starting a new innovation project in a company with a high growth business model is really straightforward. But starting a social enterprise or co-op that might be building for the long term, creating something that will be looked after for five years or ten years is much harder. We do have some encouraging things. There are more commons models, things like creative commons for digital content that are starting to make it easier to think about business models that sustain stuff. But it's still a little bit more challenging than you'd think. And there's also something about culture. We don't value maintenance like we do invention. We don't recognize maintainers like we do makers. And think of all the different places where maintenance happens in our world. Repairing infrastructure, fixing stuff that breaks, finding places where older items might still be valued, even if they're not valued where they are now, matching bits of broken goods that are needed for spares elsewhere, and stewarding shared resources so that communities can benefit from them. We've got to really design for that, and we don't always do that in our culture today. We think innovation is like magic light bulb moments, but technology is not the same as innovation. Innovation is just a small piece of what happens with tech. We're very preoccupied with novelty, um, but it fails to account for the support of technologies that are in widespread use. And it obscures how many of the things around us are really old. So in his book, Shock of the Old, from 2007, the historian David Edgerton talks about technology and use and finds that a lot of common objects, like electric fans and many bits that you might find in cars, have been unchanged for a century or more. When you think about that sort of broader perspective, um, you can really see that maintenance is out there even for tech stuff. It's just we don't think about it. We think that innovation stories are white guys in garages in California, but people around the world are working with technology, different technologies, and they're thinking about them in different ways. They're thinking not just about production, but about repair and reuse. And so while novel objects tend to preoccupy the most privileged parts of society, Folks in other places who are less privileged are thinking less about novelty and more about keeping essential things running. And the most remarkable tales of cunning and effort and care in maintaining technologies um, are happening elsewhere, perhaps not so much in our world. And we tend to forget infrastructure as well. Infrastructure is this really unglamorous term, the kind of word that would have sort of vanished from our dictionaries long ago if it wasn't so socially important. But if we talk about infrastructures more, we move away from the technical matters to the sort of deeper questions, the moral implications. And if some of you were in the ethical software talk earlier, talking about how civil engineering developed greater practices of ethics after things like bridges failed, that's something which we're still thinking about now in society. Train crashes, bridge failures, urban flooding, these are manifestations of things that are not working right in our infrastructure because we don't necessarily think about the ongoing bits of stuff we need Instead, we get distracted by flashy new things. And whether we're thinking about infrastructure or old technology rather than new things, it reminds us of all of the work that keeps the work going, the world going every day. The central fact of our sort of very industrial civilization is labor, it's work, and a lot of that labor falls into maintenance. It's not innovation labor. And innovators and inventors are a tiny slice of the world, maybe 1%. So we need to think about maintenance and distribution as well. And another important part of technological labor, if we're going to think about tech, which we tend to do at EMF, is the people who are using the product, they are also laboring. Um, it's quite different from the labor we see elsewhere. So a quick spin through a variety of things that we need to maintain today, because nothing comes without its world. This is from Donna Haraway. Um, no object comes without the need to maintain it. And so we need to think about the life cycle of the object, of how we look after it throughout. Some of the objects we might think about, community spaces like maker spaces, this is Cambridge Makespace. Community assets, 
I've grabbed a slide for open benches because I know there was a lightning talk about it earlier. But things like benches, someone has to look after them to keep them maintained, keep them all working. Communities themselves need maintenance, online or offline. Communities don't just happen. People don't just thrive together without some effort. And so, for instance, Reddit moderators play a huge role in making sure that Reddit, which we can debate how well they do it in different subreddits, but it's labor that has to get done. It's maintaining the community. Open source needs maintenance too. I've picked OpenSSL as a classic example of an open source project where there weren't actually many people maintaining it. And we didn't realize until everything went wrong with Heartbleed. And then suddenly we think, wow, we need to be thinking more about this. Someone has to look after this stuff. Standards, something else you may not think needs maintaining. We tend to think about tech standards like Wi-Fi 802.11, but there's also small standards that come in all parts of our lives. The standard sizes for screws or the standard sizes for envelopes that we've got here. And standards are critical. They help us have confidence in the world around us for food or goods or whatever. The internet. Um, I just put this here because it's a really big question. Who maintains the internet? Um, and if we followed an internet packet from my phone all the way to my friend's phone in Australia, think of all the systems it goes through and what systems, what labor is being used to maintain all of those different stages all the way through that we're so dependent on. Stuff like Wikipedia, there's a lot of maintenance goes into this, both looking after the content and keeping it organized so people can find it. And of course, infrastructure, as we've talked about. It's easy to assume in a rich country like the UK or America that infrastructure maintenance just happens. But if you think about the potholes you've probably encountered in your world, they're pretty bad here in the UK. And in the US, infrastructure is in a really bad state right now. The American Society of Civil Engineers has current recently said that 17% of American dams, and you'll note that dams are pretty big and important bits of infrastructure, are high hazard potential due to neglect of maintenance in those dams. So even in our lovely developed Western rich economies, we're not looking after our infrastructure very good. So a few random thoughts on maintenance. Who maintains stuff? Probably more people than you think. In the computer industry, um, there's a bit of research which was presented at the maintainers conference in America that software maintenance, so things like fixing bugs and distributing upgrades, can account for more than 60% of the total software costs. Um, and in one study, they found 70% of engineers were actually maintaining things rather than designing new ones. Maintenance can be blue color. We can think of mechanics and plumbers and janitors and electricians, but it can also be white color, like the IT crowd, or white jacket maintenance, like dentists. You want to think of dentists as a maintainer. And our obsession with the sort of technological novelty tends to hide all of these other forms of labor away, including things like housework. Women disproportionately keep life on track for most of us. And domestic labor has huge financial implications, but is very rarely counted in how we think about how the economy works. So in 1983, Ruth Schwartz Cowan, in her book, More Work for Mother, um, talks about how new technologies like vacuum cleaners and washing machines actually fitted into women's ceaseless labor in the home. And one of her more famous findings was that these housekeeping technologies actually increased women's labor because the idea of what length of cleanliness was acceptable increased. So they weren't actually labor saving at all. And who pays for maintenance? In open source, so something like OpenSSL until recently, perhaps the answer was nobody. It's being done by volunteers around the edges. But maintenance is also big business. If you're a big engineering company like General Electric or Boeing, you're making heavy investments in tools and procedures for maintaining all of the systems and machines that you use because breakdown means a huge loss of income. And even in digital industries, companies like Amazon and Netflix are actually doing a lot of maintenance as well, because customers are only happy when things keep working. So you need to maintain before it breaks rather than maintaining afterwards. But it is tough to find business models for that, given our focus on making things and selling them. This is a quote from a book called The True Cost of Maintenance. And in places where you maintain stuff, um, if it goes wrong, maintenance can often look like a burden. It's a cost. It's not something um, that you really want to do. And the traditional approach of management is to try to trim that cost down. And we maintain things at different times. When we pause in their use, we might maintain something on a regular cycle, like we service our car every year, or we maintain stuff when it breaks. Um, so it's quite different kinds of maintenance timings like that. And how we learn to maintain is interesting too. 
Young farmers in America used to be trained maintenance, how to look after their equipment as part of training as a farmer. And home economics classes used to teach you how to look after and repair stoves and fridges. We seem to have forgotten some of those things in more recent educational programs. And as we said earlier, things are maintained often more in poorer contexts where there's less option of getting something new or places where supply chains are limited so you don't have a choice. This is just a session from the Maintainers Academic Conference in the States last year, which I liked, showing the cycle of maintenance, how different kinds of maintenance are interconnected, in this case in the world of elevators. Um, cost of maintenance, it's quite a lot, it's good. I'm just going to spin through this. And maintenance being safety critical is interesting. This is a study of mining safety, which actually found that maintainers themselves are most at risk. Um, those doing the work are not always helpful. So just before I step on to what's happening next to maintenance, I just want to share this. Juris is an ethnographer, and this idea of maintenance as infrastructure or an autology can start to make us think that maintainers are other and they are somehow inferior. But maintainers themselves have a rich culture and value in what they do, which is worth thinking about. One of my favorite examples of maintenance is from Cambridge. We have a guerrilla groundsman who goes around repairing benches, cleaning road signs, and actually doing guerrilla gardening. Um, he's anonymous because his work is semi-legal. I assume it's a he. And he's going to be talking at my event shortly. So I think it's a really cool thing to do. And also, just briefly, digital maintenance. This is your classic XKCD. If we don't maintain our digital assets, we can lose them forever, which is perhaps unexpected. And finally, you can't actually necessarily maintain things forever either. Fairphone is not going to be maintaining Fairphone 1 because it just becomes impossible after a certain point. And there's been ideas about whether we should talk in advance about when we will stop maintaining things, perhaps putting expiry dates on Internet of Things products. So I've already touched on some of the things that are making maintenance easier these days, so I'll spin through this super quickly. New business models like leasing is really helpful, and crowdfunding can also be a way of looking after things. This is leasing jeans, in case you've not seen it, it's part of a circular economy business. Maker spaces and repair cafes make it easier to look after stuff. We've got greater access to tools as well, for tool libraries. Um, the average power drill in the UK is used for a total of 13 minutes in its entire lifetime. So we really don't all need our own power drills. So it makes sense instead to loan tools, which gives greater access to more people. The internet also gives us access to information for parts, for information on how to maintain things as well. And it helps us coordinate. This is another example from Does Liverpool, where they have a somebody should system on GitHub that helps them coordinate volunteer maintenance of the space. So, what is next? There are many amazing individuals and projects who are trying to maintain, repair, reuse, and sustain all parts of our world. And they're in the public sector, and the private sector, and they're volunteers, and they're in co-ops and collectives. And too often, they're invisible. So as you're going about your world, think about who is maintaining it and think about whether or not you could help them or recognize them or even just say thank you for the maintenance work that's making your life easier. I think this is a quote from Lee Vinsel, who co set up the Maintainers Conference in America. Innovation speak sort of worships its altar of change, but actually, why are we changing things? Why are we moving new things? Thinking about maintenance helps us talk instead about questions where we can ask more about what do we want out of the technologies and the things that we're making? What do we really care about? What kind of society do we want to live in? And so, I'm organizing a festival of maintenance. It's on the 22nd of September, and it's going to be a celebration of those who maintain different parts of our world and how they do it, recognizing this often hidden work of maintenance, of stewardship, of custodianship, of tending the things that matter. It's a whole day full of short talks and debates with a diverse range of maintainers, community managers, repairers and stewards, and the people who look after them. This is a tiny fraction of our awesome range of speakers. We've got the Gorilla Groundsman coming. I don't even know who he is, but I have faith he's going to show up and talk anonymously. We've got folks talking about digital maintenance. We've got folks talking about building facilities maintenance. We've got people comparing innovation and maintenance way more competently than me. Um, all sorts of things. It's going to be really lively, so do check it out. There's lots of information online. We've got a couple more speakers still to announce, and tickets are just £12 at the moment because we want to make sure this is an event that's accessible to the kind of people that do work in maintenance. So yeah, 
do come along and join us. And hopefully this will be part of an ongoing dialogue where we can start to think more about the role of maintenance in our world, as well as making, because making is cool too, but maintaining stuff is important. And we should try to say thanks a little bit more often to those who maintain our world. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I need a gorilla groundsman for my garden because the current groundsman is not just not cutting it. Uh, we have time for questions, if anyone has. You have no idea how bright it is up here. You're just like a wall <laughs> yeah. of light. Whereabouts is the Festival of Maintenance going to be held? It's in central London at the University of London Union, which is near UCL, Bloomsbury sort of area. It's going to be a super informal day, really chill, so do come along. Any more for any more? You're such a good audience, sticking out late on a Sunday. <laughs> They're good to come here. This feels very virtuous coming to this talk at all. Yeah, and they could just be in the bar. Well, we know that most of these people are maintainers from our sample at the beginning, so <laughs> they're all obviously interested. So, thank you. Cool. Cool. <laughs>